heart attack Fast fatal heart impact Past painful scars In fact, I blast tasteful bars and packs I back up my actions Fact, don't ask Grab reactions Jack attack with every word Then act with class As they hear me snap I got nothing to lose Cause I fought and felt the bruise Now I'm not the one confused Call the shots and they produce I ain't lost, I'm finally loose Pick a new so urge juice I need the views to boost me To a new abuse of being used Everybody wants a piece now Y'all can rest in peace now You're dead to me, so peace out Remember you're discreet now Get ready for defeat Exactly what did she do to get here? Here she is. A gut wound. A couple body aches. A, a gash in her head. And a bullet in her shoulder. Leaving a trail of blood. And with a bag. Well. It couldn't, couldn't have gotten any worse. Now, hello, hello everybody. This is Kiru Show here. And well, if the intro was a bit confusing, if you guys remember the introduction to part one of this series, the timeline has finally caught up to the intro of episode one. Now, let us begin. Whenever we last left off, Izuki has discovered the truth, and she's getting a bit more paranoid. She's been having weird dreams and suspicions. They were confirmed whenever she found out that the lady she was supposed to kill and murder was innocent. And not only that, it got a bit more complicated. Once, not only was her target innocent, she has apparently murdered previous targets before, under a trigger phrase. Now, she is quite worried. And well, it's been a full week since Ivan has checked in. And Izuki, she's just getting more and more paranoid. And people who are around her, they think that she's simply just worried, worried about her handler. And simply just think that's it. However, there's the truth. Izuki is worried about being discovered. The man died, and she was the only one around. Now, with that being said, Tonight, things are a bit different. Izuki is going over her day. Now, while she is going over her day, she's trying to recount every single minute. She was doing this at this time, she was doing this at that time, and she was doing this at this time. Then there's the one hour lunch period. That's quite strange. She doesn't remember a lot of the lunch period. In fact, she was actually still hungry after lunch. So she tries to think. What did she have for lunch? What did she do? What, who was she talking to? And it gets worse. She's beginning to add up certain things. Either at certain times during lunch or certain times during well lights out. Whenever she knows that she is awake, certain things don't add up. She once stared at her alarm clock for a solid 10 minutes. Whenever she blinked once, she realized that two hours passed. That was it. Now, tonight, well, she's actually a bit more paranoid. And she was able to do something. She began to make somewhat of a breathing mask. She's thinking that if it is something, it's either in her food. So, she simply just stopped eating one day. Whenever that didn't work, she tried something else. She tried not, well, breathing the normal air. She tried breathing in through a makeshift mask, or at least something that would be different. It didn't have proper filters in it, but it was enough to dilute whatever might be in the air. 
and she does remember that her door cracked open before something was thrown in. That being as much as she can remember. As soon as she saw the thing get thrown in, she pulled this fake mask off of her face and slid it underneath her pillow. Clearly whatever was in the air that was supposed to knock her out did not reach her mind quick enough. So, they have multiple precautions set in the place. Over the course of two weeks, Izuki has been fastly figuring it out. Whatever they are doing to them, they are putting new protocols into place, trying to fully, well, brainwash them, fully mind wipe them. They're going to make them mindless puppets to be ordered around. And tonight is the night Izuki has actually gotten what she needs. Upon an inventory check, a gas mask was missing, missing. and it was taken out by an operative. Izuki, whenever she herself went out to hunt and train, she took the operative out. She knocked the man out and left him tied up in the forest. No knives, no weapons, no anything. If the man could get out, he would. However, Izuki made sure that he would not be able to escape them. Escape what she put the man in. Someone would have to find him and cut him free. And tonight, this is exactly what Izuki thinks. She is wearing the gas mask while she is lying in bed. With the covers on her face. And she is waiting. As soon as she does hear the canister get thrown into her room, she just waits for a solid second. As soon as the people do come over and try and pull her out of her bed, she springs into action. Quickly taking a pen she had and jamming it through the man's gas mask, directly into his eye. As soon as that does happen, she grabs his handgun and quickly just turns and fires it, taking the man out with a bullet to the head. Afterwards, she herself grabs the canister and tosses it back into the hallway before running over and slamming her door closed, and quickly locking it. Now, this is quite surprising. A lot of the other people within the hallways and or inside the rooms heard the gunshots. It was loud. And the only reason for that would be an operative was found awake. Now, the people do begin to actually try running in into the area where the gunshot was heard. In this single division, there was a canister outside of the room. So they assume that it's going to be one of these students, and or candidates for the Widow program. Now, they do one thing. They check the door to the right, then they check the door to the left. Going to the next one, and then the next one. And then, they check the door on the right, and it is, well, so far so good. That candidate is asleep with a canister in their room. Then there's Izuki. They try and open the door. It's locked. The men had the key to unlock this door. So why is it still locked? And the woman quickly realizes what's going on as she brings up her cane and pulls out a knife from it. As soon as she does, she stabs it into the lock and begins to try and pull. And that doesn't really want to work. She simply just forces it in as much as she can, before pulling the knife out and grabbing one of the men's guns, firing through shots into the lock before trying to bust the door open. Now, as soon as she does do that, the door is open, and the two men on the ground are dead. And well, where is their little spy? Nowhere to be seen. And the air duct is open. So, she's trying to escape the facility, her alerting the men to simply scatter the area and look for her. Do not let her get away. Now, 
Meanwhile, as the woman runs out of the room, you do have Izuki, who, in fact, was hiding under her bed. Misdirection, a common tool for a spy. She gets up and quickly searches the men for ammo, taking two of the magazines to one of the men's pistols, and taking the other man's two magazines for his rifle. Now, Izuki also does grab the man's handcuffs. They will be useful in case she does need them. And she begins to walk away, beginning to make her way down the hallway. She needs to get to the armory. That is the first things first. If she can get there, that means that she would have a tactical advantage. Now, with that being said, while she is walking down the hallway, she begins to sneak around, taking down two to three guards while she is doing this, currently. And, whenever she does come around another corner, she quickly just begins to hide, throwing her body weight up into the air and latching onto the ceiling, trying to hold her body closer to, closer to the pipe on the roof and trying to make sure to stay hidden, as she does have to actually bust out the light directly behind her, by her foot. Now, that gives her the cover of darkness, as the person who does walk down the hallway in turns is, surprise, surprise, another Black Widow candidate, another one of her allies, her taking a breath of relief, and jumping down, walking out of the shadows to reveal herself, trying to state that it's really good to see a familiar face. She's not too sure what to do. She thought she, that she was the only one awake. And the person begins to walk forwards, not saying anything. And well, they fire off a shot. That being where Izuki, as soon as she realizes that they have a gun, she just goes for cover. She runs forward, and as soon as she does hear the, well, certain click, she completely just dives out of the way, diving down close to the ground as the person, the hammer had already moved forward, and the bullet was shot. The bullet barely, barely missing Yuzuki's left leg as she gets back up. And quickly, she does one thing. As she cleared the distance, she was able to actually just smash on this person and quickly just smash him against the wall. Quickly backing away and grabbing the gun, throwing the muzzle upwards towards their face, and suddenly just beginning to try and hit them over and over again. Izuki and the girl going back and forth. She recognizes this girl. This girl was not very good in the widow program. However, as she is fighting her right now, the girl is more focused and steadfast. The girl was one of the worst ones in the class. Izuki getting socked across the face and punched in the gut. The girl grabbing Izuki's left arm and trying to spin her body weight around, forcing Izuki's arm behind her back and actually trying to bend it more and more and more, to the point where it's starting to break. Izuki wiping her forehead off with sweat before just slamming her left hand backwards against the person. Now, Izuki, she hit the girl directly onto her neck, and the girl, she quickly just fell onto the ground, and she was paralyzed. Izuki did not want to have to do that, but checking the girl's pulse, she is still alive. So, Ironically, it looks like she's going to have to rely on her quirk in close quarters combat. If anyone does get close to her, she can paralyze them with her spit and her sweat. <sighs> this is going to be annoying. Now, with that, she does actually try and make sure her arm is okay. And going to head back through the area. Now, as she gets closer and closer to the armory, there are people arming up and getting their weapons. As soon as they have what they need, 
they just begin, searching and combing throughout the area. And Izuki, she is able to do things a lot easier. These people aren't mind controlled. So she simply just begins to light up the area. Using the AK in one of her arms, well, in one of her hands, and firing it off. While she's doing that, she brings up her other hand and begins to just fire off the gun. Now, as the bullets begin to ring throughout the area and hit a few people, Izuki is trying to aim for non-vital areas. She wants to get some information out of a few people. However, if she does see the woman in charge, she will have to go for kill shots. The woman would not hesitate. However, these people might. Now, as Izuki does do that, she's running around. Whenever someone does actually try and rush her with a knife, Izuki does one thing. She, whenever she empties the entire mag, throws the gun upwards towards the person, telling them to catch. The person going to brace for the gun as Izuki just grabs the handgun, spins it around, and tosses it directly at their forehead. The person dropping the knife, catching the gun, and getting bonked in the nose. As Izuki runs forwards and, quickly, kicks the person in the front of their shin before they fall onto the one knee. In Izuki, she smashes them directly in the nose with her palm and forces their head onto the ground as hard as she can, not only cracking open the person's skull but giving them a possible brain damage. Now, Izuki walks into the armory and she grabs a ginormous duffel bag, beginning to fill it with multiple guns, Shotguns, ARs, handguns, automatic rifles, SMGs, and grenades. She is going to need a lot of these. Plus, if she's able to actually find out where everyone is, find out where the other girls are, then that means that she can save them. They are under some mind washing or brain washing, whatever. So, where would they be? What's the one place? Hmm. Izuki trying to think in her mind. Going back to ballet. However, when Urji tries to think of that ballet stage, there isn't one. All there is, is a red room. And that actually does catch Izuki off guard. Her heart beginning to race. And... Her hands getting nervous and twitchy. She has never had that happen to her before. Her hands are always steadfast and steady, not twitchy. Now, she simply just begins to walk out. As soon as she does, she begins to encounter resistance. This being with an armed squad of the trainees, they are all surrounding her, and she does one thing. She grabs a couple flashbangs off the wall and pulls the pins to two of them, tossing them out before quickly just covering her ears and closing her eyes. As soon as she does that, they go off. As soon as they go off, Izuki quickly does one thing. She runs out, and immediately getting to the person closest to her, she's able to actually just smack them directly in the back of the head, and using her quirk, she simply just begins to spit on her hand, smashing it onto other people, over and over and over again as they're all disoriented. And they all do go somewhat smashing onto the ground, Izuki being left to deal with too. And as soon as they do that, Izuki, she's kind of sort of just left there. As soon as they do try and rush her, or at least try and use the firearms, both of them do look at each other, and there's that mutual respect for an assassin. Something that is hardwired in your brain. Whenever you see overwhelming odds, do not struggle against them. Think of it as training. And the two assassins, instead of just simply shooting her, they drop their guns and put up defensive stances thinking that they can both take her on in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
She is simply just one target. And their orders have changed. You've seen the worst assassin be able to actually match the top-ranking assassin in a few hours. So, they simply just need to make sure Izuki can hear a phrase. And if she can hear it, that means that everything will be perfectly fine. Now, Izuki, she is waiting for them. As soon as they do train rush and attack her, she quickly just defends. Both of them try and throw out left and right hooks individually. Izuki just bringing her hand up and catching both of them. Quickly just pull, pulling both their hands down as she slides downwards. And they both do try and go out for their other hands to punch. As soon as that does happen, their bodies move forwards and begin to go towards the ground. As soon as that happens, Izuki lets go of their hands and grabs the back of their legs, pulling forwards and actually just pulling upwards, getting them to actually just move rapidly and smash backwards into the ground. As soon as that happens, Izuki just wipes away her sweat and slams her hands down these two people, paralyzing them. As soon as she does that, she checks for their pulses. And whenever she does actually move someone's neck, she sees an earpiece. And she simply just grabs it out of their ear and picks it up. The woman on the other end is simply just saying that Izuki needs to hear a phrase, make sure that she can she is distracted long enough in order to have her hearing open. Now, Izuki hearing that, she's not going to have it. There is no way she is going to hear anything they have to say. And she walks back into the armory. She knows that they're here. They had them whenever they were doing those stupid gun safety courses. And she finds them. Earmuffs. Soundproof. Putting them on and beginning to walk through the facility. Quickly just shooting down armed guards. And reluctantly putting non-fatal wounds into her friends. Now, after that has happened, Izuki does actually get to the woman in charge's office, beginning to quickly just look through and try and find anything that she can. Now, Izuki finds files upon files, all digital, beginning to just simply look through them and simply try and find more information. Now, she finds out a little bit of the truth. They were all taken here for one simple reason. To be trained agents. But it's quite simple. They want to perfect the Red Room programming. And they believe that they've gotten closer. This little extra step. Instead of the false implantations of memories, and well ideas in your mind, every single day of changing them and redoing them, the veil idea, they scrapped it. And they simply are going to be trying to nudge them in certain directions. So as to maintain proper cover and actually increase effectiveness. However, the next stage of their plan will not only force your consciousness into the back of your mind, but bring that killer instinct all the way to the surface. Now, while she is actually thinking that, she is too distracted at the computer to realize the sound that she's about to hear. That being where something hits her hard in the shoulder, and she actually does go jumping backwards. As soon as she does look up, she sees the one in charge, with a handgun, telling her that she is not supposed to be in this room. Exactly what is she doing here? I'm not going to listen to you. Earmuffs. Soundproof. You're going to try and tr say a trigger phrase. Control me. Ha, ah, Izuki. Always too smart. Well, you were one of the best. In fact, you were our brightest. What you lacked in effectiveness, you made up in deadliness. 
one simple wrong move or miscalculation with your quirk. You can end someone's life. Or hurt them very badly. My, my. Truly, the perfect operative. However, there's that little thing you have, a conscience. Can't you see the Red Room? This is all my last work. Everyone around you. They are doing this project for Mother Russia. This is for her own protection. Can't you see that? Izuki is shaking her head no. She's reading her lips. And she's not going to fall for her lies. No. With that being said, the woman simply just moves to the right and introduces Izuki's friend, the girl with the knife cork that Izuki is so fond of. She's talked to. She trusts. Right now, under mind control and with blades not only protruding from her arms, but from her mouth. Now, she simply just begins to state, her best friend. Now, you are given strict orders. Do not use the knives. You'll, your battle will be quickly over. However, do not be afraid to mess her up too much. Now, the girl, she simply just has the knives retract out of her hands, her arms, and her mouth. Quickly trying to rush towards Izuki. Now, the girl goes to rush for the earmuffs, and Izuki is ready. She quickly just slides underneath the table, and goes to force it upwards, as hard as she can. As soon as she does that, there is a knife that comes to the table and tries to cut through the side of her nose. Izuki is able to force the table upwards before trying to throw it outwards. Now, as she does that, she actually does hit the woman in charge. And this desk, it weighed roughly probably about 200 pounds. Now, the girl attacking Izuki, she is simply just trying to go on the defensive trying to defend herself, trying to make sure not to grab her by her bare hands. There is currently blood in her left hand and her right hand from trying to take care of this wound. Now, she is aware of what this is, trying to defend herself against her friends. This is a clear test, a test to see what she would do, a test to see if she is ruthless enough to kill for her own survival. Now, she is trying to think, trying to talk to her friend, and simply just trying to get her attention. Trying to snap her out of it, saying whatever she can. Trying to talk about her birthday. The time they spent in the woods. How, well, they became actual friends. Izuki considers her to be her best. And, it's quite easy. Now, the girl does not snap out of anything. She's fully entranced on her mission. Killing or taking down Izuki. She cannot tell which. And the girl does actually have a knife slide out of her suit. And she quickly then just spins it around and turns it up. Slashing upwards towards Izuki's abdomen. As soon as she does that, she actually does get a good cut in on her side. And Izuki does actually try and rush forwards, tacking the girl to the ground and actually just trying to pin her. Pinning her directly underneath her, the bend in her elbow, and actually closing her hand around her mouth. Trying to simply just inform her that she is her best friend. Snap out of it! And the girl does one thing. With the flip of her wrist, a bunch of knives come out. And... She's able to cut into and actually scrape against Izuki's hand with all these blades. Izuki quickly just beginning to somewhat scream out in pain. And she feels it. The girl quickly just headbutting Izuki before trying to actually swing the knife outwards, or this ginormous blade creation. 
being able to actually hit her upwards in the abdomen exactly where she punched, well, exactly where she cut Izuki at. She's able to force this, some of these blades in there and actually get the upper hand on Izuki. As soon as she does, she throws back her hand and punches her directly in the head, hitting her over and over and over again. And Izuki, she can see that she's at the end of her rope. If she doesn't do something soon, she will die. And she's simply just beginning to create more knives and open more wounds on her chest. Izuki quickly doing one thing. She focuses her hands directly into the wound where the blades are, beginning to pull it out as much as she can, trying to pull more and more and more, before taking a handful of this blood and simply just throwing it upwards, throwing it upwards directly onto her own face, before putting it in her mouth and spitting it into this other girl's face. Now, as soon as that does happen to this other girl, her body begins to feel immense pain, and the poisons that are in Izuki's bloodstream that flow through them. She quickly stops moving, and she is pushed off of Izuki. As soon as that does happen, Izuki tries to check her vitals, and they're not good. Her heart rate is dropping fast. And it's not good either. Izuki's aware that whatever she just did, if she tries to cure her or simply just use her hair to undo this, if she pricks her with it, it will not work. The girl will just try coming after her again. And there's the lady who is pinned against the wall with the desk. She is trying to reach for her gun. It's out of range. Informing Izuki that she is nothing without the Red Room. She can't be anything without it. Now, Izuki tells her that that's not true, grabbing the gun and doing one thing. Walking over to her friend and picking up two knives. As soon as she does that, she stabs the woman's hand against the wall before doing the same with her other hand, stabbing it against the desk. Taking the file, well, the entire laptop actually, let's say, and simply just informing her that if she was nothing without the red room, then that's what she is. Nothing and a no one. Now she is going to go see her parents and try to enjoy the rest of her life reaching into the bag and pulling out a grenade. Before the woman can say anything, Izuki just stuffs it in her mouth and pulls the pin, holding it for as long as she can as she watches the woman's eyes fill with terror, telling her that she has 30 seconds to walk out of this room, the exact amount of time she has left to live. Goodbye. Letting go of the thing and walking away. As she walks away, after she gets towards the main office, there's an explosion. The woman is dead. And she simply just walks out. Now, as soon as she does walk out, you do have where we started. Roughly an hour later, and somewhere within the Russian wilderness, Izuki a bag full of guns, a lot of bodily wounds, and some head trauma. And well, a very bad wound in her, well, guts. Now, along with that, she's simply just trying to make her way to the close by town. She's getting turned around and trying to figure this all out. It has to be here close by, somewhere. And. She does do one thing. She feels like she's going to black out. She's lost too much blood. So, if she's going to do that, it's best not to be caught like this. Quickly doing one thing. She hides the, bags, the bag of guns and 
this little USB. And she begins to at least tear her suit up a bit. Tearing it up on her arms, on her legs, and quickly just beginning. Whenever she does actually get closer and closer to the town, she can feel herself start to have hypothermia set in. She's feeling very, very warm. And as soon as she gets out of the forest, she collapses onto her knees. And eventually someone does come close by. And they see her. Running over to try and make sure she is okay. Izuki just collapsing onto her side and beginning to hold onto it. Somewhat screaming out in pain not to touch her, not to touch her. Her cork is poisonous. And to simply just call a doctor, call anyone. Now, the person is reluctant to leave her alone. They do not have a phone. And they do try and actually flag down a nearby car passing by. And alert them as to what's going on. With the help of a few blankets and, well, some kind people, they're able to take Yuzuki inside and wait for an ambulance, getting her moved in there before taking her to a hospital. Now, with that being said, I do hope you guys enjoyed, and have an amazing night. I'll catch you guys in the next part.